まもなく特急ポット浄土行きが到着します黄色い線までお下がりくださいヘイヨー、イッツ、ニコラス、イッツ、ミー、フォーデス、リトル、エクスプレス、ポッド、ローレン、イッツ、カーント、イッツ、イッツ、イッツ、イッツ、イッツ、イッツ、イッツ、イッツ、イッツ、イッツ、イッツ、イッツ、イッツ、イッツ、イッツ、イッツ、イッツ、イッツ、イッツ、イッツ、イッツ、イッツ、イッツ、イッツ、イッツ、イッツ、イッツ、イッツ、イッツ、イッツ、イッツ、イッツ、イッツ、イッツ、イッツ、イッツ、イッツ、イッツ、イッツ、イッツ、イッツ、イッツ、イッツ、イッツ、イッツ、イッツ、イッツ、イッツ、Um, so, I saw recently that they, that with the, the Shadowlands pre patch update to World of Warcraft, that they apparently really、um, invigorated, I guess, or sort of streamlined the whole leveling process in WoW. And so, given what I said in、um, last week's pod, I, I see that as a, as a good improvement. So, I took a bit of a dump on, on, on Blizzard and Warcraft, World of Warcraft, in, the, in our previous podcast. So, I wanted to give them kudos for that at least. On the, the non kudos side of the, the equation, I recently noticed that、um, Blizzard EU employees are currently on strike against some, shall we say, questionable actions that the company has decided to take in their, you know, their European. Division, and I just want to express my solidarity with all of the workers on strike there because I know that what they're advocating for is a good thing, and what Blizzard, Blizzard is just in the wrong on this. And I, I, I can't, I'm not going to mince words.、Um, and so, one last thing before we get into today's little chill rant, we're going to listen to some to some lo fi beats. Well, you're going to listen to some lo fi beats currently, I'm not listening to anything. But you're going to listen to some lo fi beats while I talk about granularity. But before we get into that,、um, I just wanted to let you guys know that、um, we, as always, really appreciate you listening. And if you want to help us out, do please、um, rate and review us on iTunes. It really helps with the, the, their algorithm and sort of pushing us into to more people's pods. So, what did I want to talk about? So, my chill rant for this, for this week. Well, So, I noticed recently, and so there's, okay, so there's this tweet that, that IGN put out. I guess this is、um, October 10th, so it's you know, a little over a week ago now. And they're talking about the relationship between、um, the new、uh, Star Wars Squadrons game and sort of the, the classic Star Wars flight sims of old. And it says, despite being released decades apart, the connections between Squadrons and the classic Star Wars flight games are strong. Um, and it's interesting because I also noticed this in a lot of other media. There were some, there were a lot of reviews were trying to make the connection between Squadrons and the, the, the X Wing and TIE Fighter games of old. And、um, I want to say unequivocally that they're、um, very wrong. <laughs> I mean, they're, it's interesting because, like, there is a similarity between Squadrons and the old, like, Star Wars flight sim games in a purely, like, superficial sense. They're visually very similar. But since this, is, you know, since this is a podcast about you know, games and game design, I want to talk about the fact that they actually play very differently. And from a player perspective, they feel like completely different games. Now, a lot of this sort of press comes from the fact that like, the whole Star Wars mythos plays on nostalgia. And <laughs> I mean, because it's a commercial product, it's you know, a media commodity, and they're trying to sell. They're trying to sell you on stuff. And in recent years, the, the Star Wars media products have not exactly delivered on the, the sort of the strong feelings that people have nostalgically for the whole、um, Star Wars universe.、Um, I'm not going to mention a certain trilogy. I mean, there, there's, been, there's been some good and there's been some bad, and it's just, I don't know. I feel like there's kind of a glut of Star Wars stuff, particularly in like the past 10 or so years. They might be better off just like making fewer things and sort of like rethinking what it is they're putting out and how they're doing it. But so in the in recent press surrounding squadrons, there, there have been a lot of allusions to particularly X Wing and TIE Fighter, which were these classic PC. Flight sim games that used the Star Wars universe as a basis for the game, but really at their core, they were flight simulators. And I know this 
because I was there. <laughs> um, uh, I haven't talked too much about my myself, my personal history, but I'm kind of, I'm not an old dude, but I'm also not young. You know, I'm in my 40s now. And so, you know, my history in gaming goes back to roughly the Atari era, um, the sort of 80s arcade culture, uh, games in bowling alleys, you know, a time when video games were something that you sort of encountered when you were out in the world. Um, so when I was a, when I was a kid, I was part of a regular Saturday morning bowling league. And I remember that, like, you know, it's just it's a classic story. You know, my parents gave me like, I think like a dollar fifty or something like that and i was supposed to use the money to like buy a snack at the at the bar at the bowling alley it was you know they expected me like oh he's gonna get like you know a soda and some fries and that will be a snack for while he's bowling um i would not spend it on food <laughs> i would actually i would turn it immediately into quarters and then i would spend it on the the various arcade games that they had at the bowling alley in my hometown my favorite being the classic joust if you guys have never played Joust, Joust is amazing. Um, but in addition to that, um, I was mostly a console gamer. Um, so we had an Atari 2600 roughly around the time, the end of the, the lifespan of the Atari 2600. In fact, no, actually, I think after the lifespan of the Atari 2600, because I remember my parents getting it like super cheap from somebody because the whole, the whole Atari thing was starting to fizzle out. Uh, we had an NES when I was a kid. Uh, or Famicom, if you're in Japan. Um, we had a Genesis, not a Super Nintendo, a Nintendo 64. But and we didn't, but we didn't really get the a, a PC that was capable of playing video games until I was like in high school. And so one of the the first like genres of game that I ever played were these like sci-fi flight simulator games. So games like Wing Commander or Privateer, which was sort of a Wing Commander offshoot, um, or games like, you know, games like X-Wing or TIE Fighter, these games that were all about sort of you as a pilot. In fact, it was, it, they were actually really quite annoying to play. I remember like I had, we had this joystick that you would connect via, um, I believe it was, um, her, no, a serial port connection, and like you would have to calibrate it every single time you used it, and it was always really fidgety. It was actually quite annoying to, to use. It was like it was almost like you know, the the, the stick on an airplane. <laughs> it, was, it was actually just quite obnoxious. But um, Wing Commander in particular really sort of like set the standard for um, like science fiction flight sim games. And one of the really important aspects of these games was that it wasn't just about, you know, bang, bang, shoot them up, you know, fly around, you know, <laughs> good shot, fly boy and all that stuff. You actually had to like manage the craft as you were using it. And that like sort of craft management and sort of like loadouts for vehicles, all that stuff was as important as just sort of like ordinary like twitch reflexes and the ability to like lock your sights and, and shoot down enemy fighters. The, the game Privateer, which was a Wing Commander offshoot game, actually took this logic to, the to, to an extreme. In fact, in that game, the ships were completely customizable because you, the idea is that you were a Privateer. You were essentially like, you know, a, a chartered pirate. And so you, you would build your ship pretty much from the ground up and your, your loadout was incredibly customizable. And that's what made the game interesting because it wasn't just about choice. It was the way in which th those choices that you made about your craft, how you loaded it out and how you built it, they fed directly into the gameplay mechanics because the game had a kind of non, I mean, there were linear story elements to it, but it was mostly non-linear because the idea was that like as a privateer that, you know, you would go to space stations, you would take jobs and then based upon what you would have to do for those jobs and who you were going up against, you would build out your craft in a particular way. And so there was a lot of customizability, but the customizability was always directed towards this idea that you were doing it towards some end. And it sort of like fit seamlessly into the, the, sort of the larger way in which the, the game operated and sort of like how the narrative played out in terms of its gameplay.
And the both the X-Wing and the, the TIE Fighter games, sort of X-Wing was the first one. It came out in 93. TIE Fighter came out in 94, I believe. Um, similarly, they were about management and planning, not just sort of like in-flight mechanics in a way that, that the modern game Squadrons just isn't. And I'm not saying that to bag on Squadrons. Like Squadrons is, it's a whatever game as far as I'm concerned. Like I have no opinions really sort of good or ill of it. It's like, it's it's a fun game and you know, it gets you pumped up. And, but it, it, it's not astounding to me in, a, in any way, shape or form, but it's also not a bad game. It's like, it, it's fun and that's pretty much it. But the thing is like the aspects of those old, so a little bit that you should know about the X-Wing game and the, the TIE Fighter game as well. So when you are actually like, so just even setting aside like loadouts for your individual ships, when you're actually like in the cockpit and you're flying, it's not, you have to actively manage the various like systems of the craft. And so in the X-Wing game, the three primary systems are, so energy to shields, energy to your thrusters and energy to your weapons. And you have to balance how much energy you're shifting towards each of those three systems, depending upon what is happening at that moment in the game. And there is something like this in Squadrons, but it's a much more dumbed down version of, of it. Whereas in the, the X-Wing TIE Fighter games, like there, there is sort of a granularity of of sort of energy management while in cockpit that just isn't there in squadrons and squadrons there are essentially four states you can have all of, you can have energy evenly balanced between the three systems or you can have it maxed to shields you can have it maxed to weapons or you can have it maxed to your thrusters like there is no <laughs> like that that that's it those are those are your four options so you essentially have like four things that you can do in terms of the, the, the energy management. Whereas with a game like X-Wing, uh, I mean, okay, so just to, to get into some detail here, like, so when, when, you, when you get into the craft, your shields start off with like, you have, you know, one full level of shields in front, one full level of shields in back. If you shift power to your shields, you can then sort of boost that to two levels of shields in front, two levels of shields in back. Um, but the interesting thing is that sort of there are eight levels for each of the the energy gauges for each of the systems, or no nine because you can have z yeah you can have zero to eight essentially for each one. And so what's interesting is that like you know if you don't necessarily so if you need like shields and your weapon systems to be you know, like you know more fully functioning you can pull all the power from the engines so you can pull more power from the engines so that you're going much slower but then you're essentially like a turret <laughs> so, and you could and you can you could push the energy in whatever direction you want now what's also interesting about this is then you could functionally use your shields as kind of like a battery for the other systems. In other words, before like a major dogfight got underway in the in the mission that you were doing, you could throw all you could you know you could supercharge your shields and then set everything back to level so that way no energy was being depleted. So that way like you know when you get into a dogfight, if you weren't necessarily if you didn't necessarily need to like protect yourself too much then you could pull energy from the shields and put it into your weapons and put it into your weapon systems and but it wouldn't be at a huge loss to your shields because you would have sort of built that up initially like that sort of thing you just can't do in squadrons now on top of the sort of the energy management like in cockpit there was also a lot more granularity in terms of how you manage the craft like between missions so and what was interesting about this is that depending upon the loadout you used you could actually fundamentally transform how you did a mission so to use an example like there's a pretty common mission that is in both um x-wing and in tie fighter where like it's an attack on a large capital ship. So like say on, you know, I don't know, Star Destroyer. You're like, oh, let's go attack the Star Destroyer. And then sort of your role is sort of the, the way in which the encounter is designed. Your role is supposed to act as like an escort for the, the other ships that are going to be bombing essentially 
the you know the large capital ship that you have to to attack but you could actually change the loadout of your craft and you could equip different kinds of missiles in, you know in your in your x-wing so that way you could actually do the bombing run yourself yourself if you wanted to and so you see how like in that situation, if you choose to go for like the more like dogfighty loadout for your ship, then you could function as an escort in the way in which the um, the mission was originally designed. Or say I'm assuming that's how it was designed. Or you could load out your ship more like the bombers that you were supposed to be escorting, and then you could do the bombing aspect of that mission yourself because ultimately the objective for the mission was just to destroy this capital ship how you did it was it up to you and sort of the granularity of like choices that you had within the game sort of like the range of possible decisions that you can make about how you approach it will fundamentally change how you play the game and so that that not only provides you with a degree of like customizability in terms of your ship. It also actually offers you a degree of customizability in terms of the gameplay. And so that to me was always what was really interesting about the X-Wing and TIE Fighter games is the way in which the fairly simple mechanics of the game created a space in which you could sort of like open up a wider range of possibilities than sort of a game like Squadrons, which is a very pretty, very interesting and fun game doesn't really allow for and so ultimately so sort of that, that I, I keep using this term granularity and that's really what i want to focus on because it was really what made x-wing and tie fighter so different from a modern game like squadrons was that granularity of choice and so when i say granularity i'm not just talking about like the ability to make choices I mean, all modern games have decision-making of some kind built into them. It's not like, oh, is there choice in terms of gameplay? It's more like if you look at any given sort of like kind of choice that you can make within the game, sort of like any vector of decision-making, like what is the range of possibilities that are attended to that choice? Because if you think about like, say, you know, classic Bioware games or sort of like narrative games in which you have to decide between like the, the good option and the evil option, or maybe the good option, the neutral option and the evil option, you, you get kind of stuck into sort of this binary pattern where like the choices you make are sort of moving you along a continuum. And that's fine. Like I'm, again, I'm not trying to bag on games that do that. I mean, the Bioware games actually do that quite well. <clears throat> But that's not really a granular decision. A granular decision is one in which you have, like, where you, or instead of having, like, you know, the, the good, <laughs> the, 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 the text tree option for the good response and the text tree option for the bad response, you have a much larger range. And so, like, think about, you know, like those energy systems in, in you know, in the, in, you know, in the old X Wing game, where, because you can, because you can, it's not just like throw all power to engines, throw all power to shields. You can throw some more power to engines and and some more power to weapons while decreasing power to your shields. Or you can throw some more power to shields and some more power to engines while decreasing the power to your weapon systems. Like, the, and also the fact that you can sort of vary that by degrees. You can achieve a sort of like the precise balance that you want in that moment in a way that like, you know, simply just like, you know, boost this or boost that doesn't allow you to do. Now, the reason why this is important is because this sort of granularity of choice in decision making really affects how the game feels. I mean, maybe feel is sort of like a, a loosey goosey term here, but like, I don't know if any of you have ever played these, the, the X-Wing or TIE Fighter games, but by modern graphic standards, they look pretty awful. <laughs> um, and so you, the, the appeal of the game was never going to be based upon like, you know, polygon counts because <laughs> they just, they, it wasn't there in those games. No, the appeal of the game was based upon the way in which it, it immersed you in terms of the gameplay. In other words, when you played a flight simulator, its appeal was entirely dependent upon how much it replicated or simulated for you the feel of managing a craft in the same way that you have to manage like like as I mean it's not identical to like you know actually flying a plane, 
but it, it feels more like that precisely because you have to do all of the fiddly little things in order to sort of like keep it functioning in order to get it to to do what you want to do now i mean this is not these are not the only like <laughs> Games like X-Wing and TIE Fighter are not, you know, the only games historically that have had this degree of granularity. You see it in modern games as well. Um, it's especially common in, say, like, you know, grand strategy games like, you know, the like games put out by Paradox or Creative Assembly. Uh, games like, you know, Hearts of Iron, uh, Crusader Kings, um, like the Total War games, where there's a lot more, I mean, in many ways, like, especially a game like Crusader Kings, it's like, you know, a spreadsheet with a graphic user interface or a game like, um, or even City Skylines is kind of like this, you know, games where you, you, you can, it's not just about like, you know, I can make choices, but also like I can make any one individual choice in a whole range of different ways. Like there, there is a lot that I like in any one area of decision making there are a lot of different kinds of things that i can do and depending upon sort of the inter interactions of all those granular decisions that i make um a lot of there, there's a huge variety that results and you see this in games like you know civilization you see this in you know building games where having a a range of options available to you is immersive in terms of the gameplay instead of being immersive in terms of like you know I don't know, like visual simulation. But there can be a real downside to, to this degree of granularity because it can be extremely um, imposing. <laughs> um, and granularity of this kind can get out of control if it's, if it's not sort of kept in check. I mean, one of the interesting things about a game like, say, X-Wing, or um, a modern game like a Hades, you have a range of choices, but those choices are circumscribed. In other words, they have clear things that they do, clear like directions that they're pointing you into, but they never get so out of control where you like you're sort of presented. I mean, have you guys ever had this experience where like you go to a restaurant and the restaurant is, and then the menu is just like pages and pages and pages and pages and pages of things. Like, you know, you go to a restaurant and they may have like literally hundreds of items on the menu. And if you got these hundreds of items, it's like, you don't even know where to begin to make a choice because it's like, I don't know what to do with this. <clears throat> Whereas if you had like 20 options to choose from or maybe 15 options to choose from, it's easier to start making those kinds of choices because the the range uh the sort of the granularity of choice is um is more circumscribed and so okay again i'm not trying to call out this game but an example of where the sort of granularity can be really imposing is in a game like eve online where there is just so much you can do in that game like there's just so so much that it's it's really very, very, very hard for new players to get into. And I know EVE Online has had like a really, really long lived devoted player base. And part of the reason why it has such a devoted player base is because of that depth, the, the depth that the game has. But you see how sort of the depth in a game like that is kind of a double-edged sword, where it does a really good job of like keeping the people who are already invested, but it doesn't do as good of a job of getting people who are new to the game interested in the first place. And so there's this, I don't know, I feel like there's this sort of like middle way that you have to find between sort of like total lack of granularity and extreme granularity and extreme complexity. Like there, there, there's a sweet spot that's very, very difficult to find. And in many ways, that's where sort of like, that's the, that's the difference that game designers really have to split and really sort of discover are those because sometimes, you know, you can have choice in a game and, and but if the choice is just like choice for its own sake, it doesn't really you're not going to feel terribly invested in it. It's not going to feel meaningful. Whereas, you know, in a game like X-Wing, those cho those decisions that you make about, you know, the loadout for your craft and the sort of the way in which you manage energy systems and so forth, like they feel meaningful. They have a direct and obvious effect on the gameplay and you and you can observe those effects in real time whereas in a game like eva online where oh, like i 
I mean, I actually really love complexity in games. I love that sort of depth, and I love grand strategy games and all things of that sort. But I, for the life of me, could never get into Eve for the very reason that it's just like it's it's so daunting. It's it's the it's the menu with two hundred items on it, and like I just don't know where to start. So um, to close out this sort of express pod, this sort of chill rant with lo-fi beats. <laughs> um, I want to talk a little bit about, so I mentioned Hades. Hades is a game I've been playing quite a lot recently, and I imagine some other people have been, a lot of people, other people have been playing. Hades really does a very good job of what I was saying earlier about making those choices meaningful, because you see the effects directly in terms of your gameplay, and you see the way your decisions affect how you have to play a game in real time. And again, it's like what I was saying earlier about how like changing the loadout of your X-wing could fundamentally transform the way you, you do the mission. You transform, you can you can fundamentally transform how you play the game by you know focusing on one of the particular. And it's interesting to note that you know there's a limited set of weapons. There's five weapons, if I remember correctly. And then the choices that you make are sort of focused on like specializing that weapon set in a particular way. And so again, it's sort of like, it lays out clear paths for you to go down. And so that way, when you make a choice, when you say that like, oh, you know, oh, I'm gonna make, you know, my dash do damage, or, you know, I'm gonna add a lightning effect, et cetera, et cetera. Like you understand how that's going to play out in terms of the game. And also you can adapt it to your own play style. So for example, like, you know, my daughter has been playing Hades around the same time that, that I have been, and we play the game in completely different ways. Like we're, you know, we're doing the same like roguelike levels and so forth, but because the game gives you like ways to choose how to to you know how to load out your character that you can then like you know she's much better at like you know zipping around the screen and like dashing and sort of moving back and forth because she's much younger and her twitch responses are much better than mine whereas you know i i need to i tend to prefer you know the bow and i tend to prefer builds that are based around the bow because it's sort of like i'm much better at like positioning and sort of like tactically approaching each level but again that's the beauty of that game by having that degree of granularity what's interesting is that it could take two completely different people and there are com two completely different ways of playing the exact same game and accommodate them precisely because the choices you make aren't just like you know they're not just binaries it's not just like do it this way or do it this way but it gives you a range of options and it's that range that really sort of creates the, the degree of immersion in terms of gameplay that like to me so so this is this might sound strange to you guys like if i wanted to pick a you know a contemporary game that feels to me the way x-wing felt when i first played it it's a game like hades it's not a game like squadrons which interestingly like there is this like visual and like i guess you could say historical lineage there's a visual similarity and historical lineage but the games just don't feel the same and it's that feel and it's that granularity in terms of gameplay that really sort of makes the difference in my opinion so that's all for the, this brief rant um we will be back with a regular pod um, next week in which we talk about player psychology. Um, I've talked with Lauren and hopefully in the future we may even have like a longer discussion about Hades and its sort of interesting narrative structure. But until then, I really, really hope you guys are staying safe. I hope you guys are staying healthy and, you know, just take care of yourselves and each other. And I will see you on the flip side.